Hey, this is Matt Adler, and you are listening to The Rock Stop with Chris Contra. Hi, I'm Laura San Giacomo, and you're listening to The Rock Stop with Chris Contra. All right, welcome in to The Rock Stop. Chris Contra here. This is going to be a really cool show tonight. I am joined by two very talented people in the world of acting, and they just so happen to be husband and wife. First, let me introduce Matt Adler, the star of the classic surf film North Shore. You've also seen him in Whitewater Summer, Dream a Little Dream, Teen Wolf, many awesome credits to his name. So how's it going, Matt? All is well. Thanks. Thanks for having us, Chris. Definitely. I really appreciate you being here. And now I will introduce your very lovely wife. She rocketed onto the scene with her unforgettable performance as Cynthia in Sex, Lies, and Videotape. And she's been adding on to her filmography ever since with roles in Pretty Woman, Just Shoot Me, Under Suspicion, and NCIS, just to name a few. I'd also like to welcome to the show, Laura San Giacomo. Thank you, Chris. My pleasure. So this is really great having both you guys here on the program tonight. Uh, a lot of a lot of history in, in film and TV on the line right now. And uh, you guys are obviously known to the public for your on-screen work. But what many people may not know about is your guys' charitable work and the organization Momentum Wheels for Humanity, which is a really important cause that I uh, I wanted to mention here at the top of the show. We'll talk about it a bit more later in the interview, but if you wanted to mention the website and uh, what the purpose of, uh, of the organization is, please feel free. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. I really appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah, it's um, it's an organization that's very near and dear to our hearts, and Laura and I have been working for this organization for probably pretty close to 20 years. Um, Momentum Wheels for Humanity uh, is an organization that delivers and uh, makes possible um, mobility tools and implements for people around the world in developing nations where uh, it is very, very difficult to procure wheelchairs, uh, walkers, canes, gait trainers, any, any type of mobility device that would help people who are uh, physically disabled or, or in need of other uh, mobility devices. Um, that's what we do. And Laura's going to chime in and help out. And then also what they do is they provide research and also in-country training for seating specialists as well as making sure there are therapeutic units in country for uh, physical therapy and um, so that it's not just dropping wheelchair wheelchairs off. Also, they have designed and manufacture their own wheelchairs that are specific for third world countries. So they contract with governments as they are implementing wheelchairs into the medical model of the country's structure. So in some places, it's not even part of the medical model to get a wheelchair. So as they're doing research, changing policy, they're also contracting with governments that they can buy these wheelchairs at a very low cost and distribute them to persons who need them. That's great. I mean, there's probably a lot of people who feel kind of locked in their home because they have no no real way of getting around. And, and you mentioned how uh, how deep it really goes. It's not just, you know, drop off a wheelchair and say, you know, have a good day. But they really put some uh, other resources into this as well. Absolutely. Because you can I mean, just it's just the wheelchair or the mobility device is just one facet. I mean, if you're a person who who needs a wheelchair, but you know, the wheelchair itself is causing you, uh, whether it's uh, an orthopedic issue or a skin issue, like where do you go? Right. Well, countries, a lot of these developing nations, they have no infrastructure to deal with specific needs of people who who need mobility um, accommodation. So part of what Wheels does around the world is implement, as Laura was saying, um, training for physical therapists and occupational therapists and seating specialists and, you know, go into clinics and teach people how to help people. And also, it's exactly what you're saying. It's it's kids stuck on the floor 
and it's adults stuck in their house and not through any fault of their own. It's just that the society, the community has no way to support them. And so when they get wheelchairs, they're off to school, they're making friends, they're going to work. It affects the community, the whole community, in such a positive way. Right, right, and you and you hope that uh, these communities are, you know, wheelchair accessible. A lot, a lot of places are, especially you know here in this country, you can get in with ramps and things. So it, you're right; it really does open up the world to uh, to to people when they're able to acquire these uh, these um, mobility uh, products. Right. It's yeah. it's it is about ex- it's accessing your community. And that's what, you know, they're they're trying to what we're trying to do. We try to influence the culture to change the culture, to make them more aware of the, you know, to make them aware of the value of the people that are, you know what I mean? Like these people value. And if you can get them out of their house and into a chair and into school and into work and into the community, you'll see, you know, that's where you will see. Their yeah. value. Yeah, it's very admirable work you guys are doing uh, using your celebrity in that way. And I will certainly leave the link to the website. So for anybody listening that that feels compelled to contribute in any way, uh, I'm sure the organization would uh, be very appreciative. So, um, you, yeah, I really appreciate that. Definitely. So, so uh, yeah, we want to talk about uh, your careers a little bit. You both, I guess, took very different paths, or were those paths kind of similar in in getting into show business? Um, I think they were kind of similar. I mean, no, no, actually the opposite. They were not similar. <laughs> she doesn't know anything about, about me. I don't know <laughs> about us. I'm not very, no, no, we're re- <laughs> really different. I went to um, a four-year acting school. I went to Carnegie Mellon. I went to New York after graduation, and I was there for about five years before I came here. And so I was doing like readings off Broadway and then off Broadway plays. And then I did a couple of things on television and then I got my first movie. So um, it was a really uh, kind of gentle role and a mm, substantial like struggle, but really all good, all really fun Mm -hmm. and uh, waitressing and all that kind of stuff um, to you know, kind of become a little bit more well-known. And Matt's was very different. (laughs) Yeah, I was like, not going to go to college. I didn't, you know, there was nothing. I knew I wanted to be an actor and I was already studying acting outside of high school at the Lee Strasberg Theater Institute. And I kind of knew that's the path I was going to take. And uh, so uh, right out of high school, I I got a job as a, you know, a, a the guest star on Trapper John MD. And I think I got another one that summer on a movie of the week, like two weeks of work. I couldn't believe how much money they were going to pay a 17 year old person. Yeah. And I didn't know anything about the, 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 the business. I, I didn't know what an agent did. And I, I got an agent from the show I did at least Strasburg. And then I was just kind of in, I was just starting to audition for movies and tv shows and i and i realized like that's that's the path i'm going to take i'm not going to go to college i'm doing this this is what i want to do yeah and the first you know the first 10 years were pretty great pretty great pretty busy definitely different uh different paths there for you and your wife it's interesting that you were both kind of in the late 80s early 90s really starting to become known to the public uh both you now laura did you um did you know of matt as an actor at that around that time no, I didn't. I met him when I first came out to L.A. Um, and uh, we were friends for a long time before we started dating. Yeah, we met each other uh, through another friend of mine. And she would, has, was, had just come out to Los Angeles and like Sex, Lies and Videotape was getting ready to come out. And that's what right, we met right before that. I think that came out what, uh, 1990 or 91. Um, 89. Oh, okay. So we were friends for about yeah, we just 10. Met. Yeah. We, we met started. in 89. Yeah. And then we started dating in like 97. 97. Oh, okay. Yeah. We were both married to different people and we had both gotten divorced and, um, and we were just friends hanging out and Matt would come over and, um, help me with our son and, then we started dating. We're, we're still getting along pretty good. <laughs> That's okay. A- we're doing okay for a big rebound relationship. Yeah. <laughs> you know, 
I, I wasn't supposed to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely you are. I, I wanted to ask uh, Matt about uh, the movie North Shore. I was just watching it back. It's such a sweet movie. Like, it's a real good, feel-good movie that uh, it, it deals with uh, surfing, for those of you who haven't seen it. I think it's it's got a good love story in there. It's got uh, great characters, and uh, I really enjoy the movie a lot. I'm glad. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was... Um... Yeah, it was like, you know, sort of the end of an era, I think, of movies where it was, you know, it it is a sweet movie. It's a it's a feel good movie. And, you know, I've I've often sort of described it as a karate kid in the told in the surf, you know, milieu of surfing, because it's a you know, it's a little bit of a of a of a student and master movie, a love story, uh, an overcoming obstacles story and um, and told in that kind of innocent 80s style. Right, exactly. I think that's a great comparison to the Karate Kid, which is that that gets a lot of attention. It's certainly uh, in that in that same type of vein uh, of yeah. of that uh, of that genre. And um and now I heard that you had to send uh, filmmakers uh, videos of you surfing to to kind yeah. of show that you could, of course, handle the uh, those stuff in the water, but also the dialogue because they didn't just want to get a surfer, I guess, but an actual actor. Well, actually, to tell you the truth, what they were ho- what they wanted to do because they thought that the surfing was such an integral part of the movie, they wanted to see if they could hire a professional surfer, a kid who you know, was on the pro surfer track and see, you know, if they, if he could do the acting and universal said, no, we're not going to give the lead role of a movie to a guy who's never acted before. So that's when they started looking at actors. And I had worked fairly recently with Randall Kleiser on flight of the navigator. And he had reached out to me and he said, you, I remember you telling me that you surf. And I was like, yeah. And then he told me what this movie was. And I, sort of freaked out and uh i i was like yeah yeah i surf i'll, I'll do whatever you want and i uh, i went and made videos of myself surfing and sent them in and like all of the which was kind of one of the great things about that movie is the three male you know lead characters of myself and john philbin turtle and greg harrison chandler we all surfed in real life mm-hmm. which brought i think a lot of it it helped in terms of the authenticity of the movie and seeing us actually surfing. You guys clearly knew what you were doing. And uh, Laura, do you are you uh, much into surfing? Do you? I mean, clearly Matt had been doing it for a long time. <laughs> yes. No, I'm not at all into surfing. I am. Uh, while I enjoy the water, I am a land animal. <laughs> I watch him surf, and um, I encourage his surfing, but I don't do the surfing. Okay, I got you. I got you. And and then uh, Matt, I wanted to just ask you another thing about the movie is the um, the actress that played Kiani, of course, known uh, Nia Peoples. But I, I saw a deleted scene or something like an alternate ending where there was a different actress. Was, was she filming the whole movie with you, and then they switched her out at the end, or was it just like they filmed the end first with her or something like that? There was another actress hired for that role initially. And after about a week and a half or so, I think, of shooting, uh, the producers made the decision that she was not working out. They um, just thought it wasn't going to work with her. And Nia came in and replaced her. And then how did you go about getting those surf videos made of you uh, that you had to send to them? Well, in 1987, you get your friend to bring a video camera. And uh, that wasn't a GoPro. That wasn't waterproof. Right. You had actual tape in and uh, you have your friend videotape you from the beach. And then uh, just one more question on that movie would be there's that sequence where you're using like very long, big surfboards like the old school ways. Uh, Was that difficult trying to, you know, adapt to that style? Because I doubt you were, you know, using that in your in your own life. Right. Um, you know, I had surfed quite a quite a few different styles of surfboards, but sort of all within the the realm of modern surfboards, but some long boards and short boards. The one that was really interesting was the the first board, the Koa Wood surfboard that had no fin that weighed, you know, 100 pounds that you just got that thing going straight and you could, you know, steer it with your foot. I don't know if you remember that sequence in the movie. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, that was really difficult to 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 just to get the one wave on it and like so that I could stand up, go straight, get my foot in the water, turn that board. It was really fun. But difficult. But the rest of the boards were pretty, you know, there's an adjustment you make for for each board. But when you've been when you do it, when you've been doing it for a long time, it's not 
not that big of a learning curve. Gotcha. Okay, gotcha. And then, uh, Laura, I wanted to ask you about uh, Sex, Lies, and Videotape. This was, um, I mean, the, I, I said at the top there, it kind of rocketed you onto the scene. Everybody was kind of talking about you after that movie. Now, to your knowledge, was there a lot of other women up for that role of uh, Cynthia? Oh, yeah. But, you know, before we start talking about this, I want to talk about North Shore because I really think that it is, just as you're saying, it is such a sweet movie, but... It, it has such a, um, such a poignancy, and I really think it is so poignant because of who Matt is and who he was as that young man, and that well beyond his years had a, a sensitivity and um, and um, and just this sweet nature that really makes that film. I think that he really makes that film. I didn't pay. I, didn't, I don't pay her to represent me as an agent, but you know, sometimes I can't stop her. <laughs> I mean, I, I I totally see your point, Laura. Matt made uh, Rick Kane very easy to root for. Exactly, but I really understand why. You know, people just I I have just watched people follow Matt down the street and just freak out when they see him and I can really understand. I mean, there's this guy that I know of and he's like based his whole life on Rick Kane, the character of Rick Kane. And, you know, it's a it's a pretty good model of a of a a really wise young man and a really sweet and poignant and sensitive young man. So Well yeah. thanks, babe. I appreciate that. You're welcome, babe. <laughs> oh, yes. Now me. Okay. <laughs> well, I think there was actually um, probably um, some people. I'm sure there was. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, I just was very lucky that uh, that uh, I Stephen chose me. I auditioned for him and um, and I was just very lucky to be a part of it. It's, of course, very competitive in the world of acting. You can't even think about that other stuff, right? No, you can't. It just would drive you crazy. You just go in and you do your two minutes. And and for those two minutes or five minutes or six, whatever you get, it's yours. And you get to do what you want with it. Authentically, you, your choices, your take on it. And they're either going to like it or not or think it's intriguing but not exactly works with their vision. So that's just... That's just the nature of our business. Right. And um, after, do you remember seeing it for the first time after it was, re or uh, maybe, did you watch it before the release or did you watch it like, the, like everybody else at the premiere or something? No, we used to watch dailies in a gymnasium or a cafeteria of a school with no sound, which was really interesting. I'd never worked on a film before. That was my first film. So I did go to a couple of, um, dailies screenings at the end of the day. And I remember the first dailies I went to was Andy's scene where she's in the psychiatrist's office and she, I watched like six or seven takes of her blushing on cue with no sound. And I thought, oh my God. She's amazing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was right. And it was just kind of a, a you know, in, in that kind of scrappy atmosphere, that's what it was, kind of like emerged this um, very cool piece, which, I mean, nobody ever knows beforehand. Yeah, right, right. And um, the movie's obviously a quite risque. I mean, it's sort of an indie indie movie where they could be a little more risque with uh, what they do and i mean uh, what did your family think when uh, when they saw that oh my god i have no idea i i i must have been slightly disturbing i would think <laughs> but i had also done i had also done a play in new york called beirut um which was actually sort of a commentary on aids although it wasn't about aids but it was about a pandemic that was um, transmitted through spit. And um, 
and most of that play I was in my underwear. So it wasn't like uh, I had never done anything that was kind of risky and that play wasn't necessarily overly sexual in nature but um you know yeah it was the late 80s you right. know right where things were blowing up it wasn't the 1950s now now you talk about plays did you both do plays kind of before uh doing film work and tv stuff yeah i did uh regional theater in a bunch of different places around the country and um, did Shakespeare in different um, theaters in uh, Philadelphia and Kansas City and Virginia. So I, I did all of that kind of the regions and uh, also um, off Broadway stuff and off off Broadway stuff, new plays. Yeah. Off- I didn't do near as much uh, theater as that, but I did some all, all in Los Angeles, you know, small equity waiver, you know, less than a hundred seat type small theater productions, you know, um, which I loved doing. It was really, you know, it's great. It is, it is, I think the most fun in terms of acting for me, um, is that live audience energy is just the greatest thing, but I didn't do as much of it as I would have probably liked to do. Yeah. I, it's, you're right about the live crowd there. I always wonder about like, you know, because because when you're doing like a, a movie or a TV show, you're not getting that instant reaction from the crowd that uh, that you do in in like plays and theater and stuff, especially in comedy. I mean, com- I think comedic movies are really difficult because you don't get that immediate feedback. And I think you're you're sort of relying on the the reaction after a take is over of sort of what does the crew do? Do they start laughing when the director yells cut or, you know, did they get it? It was that actually funny. I think it's tricky, which is why I think that a really natural what I kind of always loved and was attracted to was the four camera, you know, multi camera sitcom because mm-hmm. you get sort of the best of both worlds in a, in a certain sense. Right. That's a good but point. I, yeah. I never got one. I never got a good one. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I guess any acting is great, but um, like, is there a genre really you we like to uh, that you would have liked to do more of? I guess I know it sounds like Matt uh, comedy, comedy for sure. Yeah, yeah, I like both. I like any, you know, all styles. I like all styles, and I feel fortunate when I get to do, um, when I get to do either. So mm-hmm. I'm pretty happy. We, you know, there there is something super special about comedy, um. Because there's nothing like going to work and laughing all day. Yeah. And that is a pretty unique situation. And so that's lovely. But then there's also nothing like a really intimate emotional scene where you're doing something and it's just a camera and a very small crew and other actors and you feel the this sense inside yourself where you believe what is happening, you are suspended for this moment in time where something real is happening to you. And there is a lot of electricity in the air. Like that's amazing too. Yeah. So like when you shoot a scene and you, you know, you feel that energy going on uh, right then and there, are are you like excited for audiences to see this moment and see how it translates onto the screen? Um, somewhat, but I think that there is, a if, if you're just an actor, if you're an actor for hire and you're not involved in any of the rest of the process, there's a certain amount of letting go that you have to do because it is not up to you. Your performance and the scene will be shaped by people who are knowledgeable and, you're you're giving the ingredients and they're going to shape the scene for the good of the whole piece in the tone that they want uh with the energy that they want and with the rhythms that they want that fulfill that story so hopefully you're there to serve the piece and to um you know feel something electric going on but you're also in a certain sense, an ingredient because right. they are going to mix. They are going to mix and cut and put together and shape the piece. 
I, I this is why I love talking to actors and actresses because you guys really have a, a way of looking at it that the <laughs> ordinary viewer probably doesn't. I guess does that it kind of leads into the question: Do you guys watch your own work? Um, she hates. To I, so it's I so painful. <laughs> oh my god! Well. <laughs> It's very painful for many reasons. Like, as I'm just saying, there was, I just comes to mind really quickly uh, for me is a scene that I did where I had laid in like three little things in this scene. Very subtle, very little. One was a tagline to the end of the scene that made a lot of sense to me. And I felt were really made a lot of sense to the character and when i saw the finished product all three of those things were cut out of the scene oh. and it's like you have to say that's why i say you need to detach you say i'm bringing this uh, you know as multifaceted and as authentic a per- performance as i can and they need to shape it because if it's extraneous it needs to go no matter how you feel about it so you got to you got to be able to it's a process of letting go I got gotcha, you right. Yeah, uh, Matt, do you uh, you have any, something you want to say on the matter? Yeah, you know, I mean, I don't. I was always kind of excited to see the end product, you know, of a movie that I was in or a scene that I did in a movie, or. Um, but the actual watching of it was always painful, always cringy, always, you know, oh, I think that I'm awful. I think that was awful. Do you think that was awful? And trying to get a read of like, you know, I just, it's uncomfortable for some actors. I think probably for a lot of actors, probably some don't have that kind of reaction. I I just think it's very difficult to watch yourself do that job. Right. At least it is me. Mm-hmm. But I still, I still like when a movie was going to come out, I was excited to to see, but it was very nerve wracking. And to be honest, I haven't really done any on-screen acting in a long time. I don't know what I would think of it now. I think I, I did a couple of episodes of the Bonnie Hunt show a number of years ago, and I enjoyed watching that. I think I was with a friend. We were doing, we were playing comedy writers, and the other comedy writer was a friend of mine, and um, we had a really great time. And working with Bonnie is fantastic. Um, and uh, I actually enjoyed watching that, and I liked what I did in it. But that's one of the very few few things I can think of where I watched it and I liked it. Gotcha, gotcha. You both have very interesting things to say on that. I love to watch her, and she I won't let me. I love to watch him. <laughs> oh, see, now that's interesting. <laughs> so you like to watch each other. Yeah, I love to watch her stuff. Yeah. She, I'll say this about Laura and the difference between... Um, you, you know, she... She is a consummate professional as an actor. So for her, like when she was talking about the difference between comedy or drama or what, it doesn't matter to her what she does. When I watch her work, I, I just realize like she is an actor's actor. She is – there is a, a, a sense of believability and naturalistic style. Well, I know I am looking at a human being – who is experiencing these moments as an, as an actor and as a person simultaneously. And that's, that's what being a professional actor is. I am. And I don't mean to just say this in a self deprecating way. I'm not as, I'm not that good. I'm not as she is. a. It's just a different level. And, and I really mean that it really is true. Laura is a top, top notch actress and that, you know, you, you haven't done as many things lately. I, I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess that's what you're trying to say here, but uh, definitely uh, Laura's top notch. Your, top your notch. presence is really piercing. Your presence is really electric and you are, your presence commands watching. So I don't know if you can really say that. And it's been a while and, I, you know, we do a lot of like Matt helps me a lot with auditions and self tapes and all that kind of stuff. So we are uh, we do a lot of scene work together and he's an amazing director and a really good scene partner as well. So we have a lot of fun. I mean, I think we have a lot of fun acting. We do. It's yeah, fun to act with her. I've never I've only I, I don't think I've ever done anything with you in it. In no, not in it. Not in an actual sense. No. But, um you cast me in. Um, I did. I helped her get a job. Me. 
He well, he helped me get a couple jobs because you cast me in your show that mm -hmm. you did that was called Unscripted. Unscripted, yeah. And then um you also helped me get Barry because mm -hmm. you helped me with that audition. You mm -hmm. directed me that audition. And he is uncannily he memorizes a script so quickly and he's so um you're so naturalistic in your reading. It's like you embody it so quickly, whereas I have to do all this work just to do the audition. And in two readings, you're already like have these beautiful pauses in and you've got this rhythm going and you've got this. That's because the really camera's natural. not on me. As soon as the camera's on me, I clam up. <laughs> See, see, this is very interesting. I, I, I'm hearing that, you know, you're mad you talk about it's being self-deprecating and things, but it sounds like you play a, a vital uh, role behind the scenes, and, uh, and, and that should not be uh, underestimated either. Well, you know, I think that we're lucky. We're, we're, we're in terms of, you know, what our daily life is as actors. I mean, we don't, you know, Laura gets a lot more. I don't really audition anymore, and she does. And so she's she has a good partner in me because i know what she's going through so i think if you're not married to an actor like we have a friend <laughs> who's married to a lawyer and she's <laughs> she's uh, her audition process is a hellscape for her because she's trying to get her husband to like say you know stop freeze or i'll shoot you know, was <laughs> yeah authority and it's uh it's pretty funny the story she tells about having to act with her non-actor husband <laughs> right interesting point right there and like for example i know uh, a more recent movie that you did laura was a movie called tall hot blonde which was directed by courtney cox like for example the, your husband in the movie played by a uh, garrett dillahunt um mm -hmm. did did um matt go over some of these lines with you uh, kind of playing into that role I don't know. I don't feel like we worked remember. on that. I don't remember. You know, I think that he was fantastic in that role. He was that movie. And, oh, God, I just think I kind of missed the boat with that so much. Really? I didn't, like, really. There was something that was really missing. I, I, I can't even talk about it. See, but she, he, that's how but she he feels about it. But he was really amazing in that. He really embodied that. And he was so... He was so present in the moment, and I just, I just think I, uh, when I saw it, I was really like, "Oh, brother, Laura." <laughs> See, she was great. I, I thought no, she was great. No. In movie. Oh, God, I thought she was great too. I, I'm actually surprised to hear this. I, I thought your performance was uh, fantastic. I, but I guess you know, as the actor that you are, you, you see it different. She can't take it. She can't stand herself. No, on I'm screen. making I'm making all kinds of faces right now. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> I I enjoyed the movie, and in fact, I was uh, just looking up some of the reviews of it, and a lot of people were uh, praising your performance as well. Both you leads, uh, you and the guy that played Thomas Montgomery. I thought uh, you both did it. Yeah. That's very very shocking and surprising. Oh, well, <laughs> do you do you uh, do you want to pinpoint anything that you feel like was a miss? Yeah, I think that was a mess. I don't know. <laughs> I, no, in the oh, movie. In the, thing, in the movie, yeah. I just think that. I I just think I didn't. Um, you know, sometimes there it. It's, 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 in a certain sense, it's a finite process because it is going to be filmed, but in another sense we are growing and getting smarter and changing and able to reveal a different parts of ourselves at different times of our lives to differing degrees. Okay. You know, not Meryl Streep. She's doing it. She's there. You know, uh, the iconic actors are just being all the time, but um, there was something that I missed in that process that I didn't see. And um, I recognized that the the whole thing in my performance was kind of off. And so I don't know. I can't identify it. But when I think about that project, I just go, man, you just it was almost like I hadn't. Um, you know, like binoculars, you adjust it, and then all of a sudden it's really clear. Mm -hmm. Is that what I'm thinking about, like binoculars? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like I never quite fine-tuned it. I, I always try to get a hook, 
I always try to have a metaphor. I always try to build this bridge between this person that I am learning about, this character, and myself. And I feel like I never got it into focus. Like, oh, almost. But it just, it never quite fell. It never quite dropped in. But don't you think that Meryl has those feels that way about some I'm sure she does. I'm sure she does. It doesn't appear like that to us, but are we really here to debate all of that? Chris, this is what I'm talking about. (laughs) Okay. So she just gave you that whole monologue about what she felt she missed in that part. Right. And as much as like, as I'm pretty close to it in terms of I'm an actor too. And I, almost don't know what the hell she's talking about (laughs) so that's what i mean when i say she's an actor's actor when she's talking about fine-tuning like i'm she's missing something so subtle that i don't understand i definitely see your point matt i mean i thought the performance was very good she handled all the uh, emotional stuff right in my mind but i guess we're not seeing it like uh uh, the, the consummate professional actor uh, that Laura is. Right. There is a connection to these characters that she plays that I think I'm only, I'm only like, if I'm lucky, I'm kind of skating. Like uh, I get a, a, a pass around or I'll get close to it. But I think that's where she sort of lives as an actor. When she, there's a connection to those characters that I don't know that I ever get, mm. huh. but maybe I do. And I don't, I, I, yeah. I, or it comes through. But I don't know that I can talk about it the way you talk about it, the way you can define it in a way that I can't define it. Way too How many boring words. is blah, this? Blah, Jesus. blah, blah, <laughs> blah. God. That's what your Just people like our hear, life. Chris? This is our life every day. I'm going blah, 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 blah. And Matt's like, I'm going to go play golf. Well, I think this is why I, this is so great. Why I want to have both of you guys on because <laughs> I really see the you know, contrast in things. <laughs> But uh, but yeah, you mentioned like you know pl- identifying with a character. You you never really uh, felt you had that, Matt, and um, like with uh, any of your performances that you could really identify with this. I mean, I would imagine uh, in your role at uh, Rick Kane, you probably could have closest, maybe. Well, Rick Kane probably the closest because mm-hmm. although I had very I had not a whole lot of experience as an actor by that point. I had some, but not a whole lot. But. I really was that guy. I mean, I was that innocent in terms of my experience as an actor. I was um, that out of place as the lead of a movie. And in this ultra macho world of surfing on the North Shore of Oahu, which is the epicenter of surf culture, macho surf culture, and, you know... like I was that innocent. So yeah, in in a certain sense, that was probably the close character was to who I actually was as a person. And I think that's what Laura was talking about when she talks about a certain sincerity. You know, I was, I played it all straight. Yeah. I was all sincere to me. Right, right. Laura, do you have a, uh, a character that you think you identified uh, more than maybe others that, in your uh, career? Um. Well, I feel... I feel like I um, I really understood like several characters that I've played. Re- I've understood them really well. I, I understood Cynthia. Mm-hmm. Um, I I think my Gallo was really close. My Gallo was pretty. Was also um, pretty. Yeah, I mean, my yeah, I guess mm-hmm. and. I think the character that I played in Under Suspicion, I think, really got a hook into that. And I really had fun doing that. Yeah. And um, oh, bits and pieces along the way. Yeah. A little, you know, a little bit of everything. I just think it's funny, like, that particular project that you mentioned is really, like... <laughs> Like a lot of the the other ones I feel pretty good about. (laughs) So I found the one that was complete opposite. But there are just as many parts I didn't get that I felt really connected to. Because I, uh, when I'm auditioning, it's like what I said about auditioning. That's two minutes. That's six minutes mine. And I've worked on that. And I've made a connection. And I've had some auditions that that I'll never forget that I was so connected with. 
that there was real things happening for me in that scene and that I loved doing. Mm -hmm. So there's, it's such a broad, long life of work. And it's such a crazy kind of work to do yeah. because you're, you know, totally messing around with your emotions and your, and your personality and la di da. But, yeah. um, so it's, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And, and I wanted to ask about, um, uh, Matt, you worked with Kevin Bacon. Now everybody talks about, you know, the six degrees of Kevin Bacon and how, <laughs> <laughs> how close it's zero degrees. You're zero degrees, babe. <laughs> well, does Laura, have you, I, I'm not sure if you've ever worked with uh, Kevin. I haven't, but I've met him because of Matt. But weren't you in a movie that he was in? Doesn't, wasn't he in, um, uh, murder in the first? I wasn't in Murder in the First. The Mark Rocco Murder in the First? No, Where no. the Day Takes You is what you were in. <laughs> oh, no. You in where, the, where the Day Takes You? Yes, yes, you yes, 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 I was. Okay, yes, I, I was, was thinking yes, Murder was. in the First, but okay, you were not okay. in that. Okay, okay. No, I wasn't in okay. that. Okay. <laughs> no, but I've met, I met him through when I, we were together, we ran into him somewhere. Yeah. Okay. She's not a degree -er. So I'm a one <laughs> slash zero, just have met. I've met, and I think that that counts in the game if you've, met him. if you've met him so i'm a i was a one and now i'm a zero <laughs> all right okay. now i got it now i got it straight um and i've yeah. run into it several times and yeah. you guys are always really chatty yeah oh that's cool so you you uh you became friendly with him uh I, that was the first time you met him on the set of whitewater summer that was the first time i met him we spent like three months together in the mountains doing that movie and then we went to new zealand and then we went to canada um, and I think on the way back from one of the, the from the Canada reshoots, I spent some time with him in New York. Um, and he showed me around New York City, and uh, we had a good time together. And yeah, we've remained friendly. I don't, you know, we're not at all. I would say close in any way, you know, real way. Now, mm -hmm. uh, follow him on Instagram. I see his Monday Blues posts, and uh, <laughs> great. He's he's was always a great guy to me, you know. And and I I learned a lot from him and. Uh, really had a great time making that movie. Cool. You know, every time I think of that movie, that the first uh, scene that comes to my mind is on the bridge, the bridge scene where you guys are all going across it. Uh, mm -hmm. how, how was that uh, filmed? I imagine it wasn't as dangerous as it looked. Oh, no, no, no. Let me tell you. So we first shot a scene in Northern California on the McLeod River over a bridge that was not scary at all. Uh -huh. And Columbia was like this we gotta this bridge scene is not scary like it doesn't look like this kid's in any danger at all so we need to reshoot the sequence somewhere else so at the time that they said that it was now full-blown winter and it was you know this is a summertime movie so we went to new zealand because those mountains had a very similar look to the sierra nevadas mm -hmm. and it was summer and we shot that over one of the most terrifying bridges I, I've ever been on. Oh, wow. It was literally one plank of wood wide. And it was, it had two, like, you know, you, you hold on to the two, you know, cables. And, uh, and that thing is blowing and moving. It was terrifying. Wow. But awesome, you know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we all, as soon as we got to that set, we walked across it. And then we came back and the producers were like, what the hell were you doing? You guys are not allowed out there. You know, so oh. they had Sean Stuntman and like they weren't allowed. They didn't allow us after that to go across it. But yeah, it was spectacular. That was about a 300 foot gorge into this little river. And it was awesome. Man, you know, I, I, I was not aware of that. So so it really uh, sort of a dangerous, challenging sequence to film, huh? Yeah, and there were actually several of those in that movie, if you remember. I mean, there was a lot of rock climbing. There was a lot of, um, you know, running and, like, running up and down rock trails, slippery, like, you know. And also, it was the 80s, so we were doing all that stuff ourselves for the most part. Yeah. Wow. That's, and it was, yeah. you know, we were 18, 19 years old. We were having a, 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 the time of our lives. Yeah, definitely. And it, it kind of shows in the movie. I, I always enjoy that movie. It's a very fun uh Fun summertime movie and uh, with some with freezing some thrills. Well, really, freezing. Uh, but yeah. summer, yeah. <laughs> we're in the Sierra Nevadas. We were supposed to start in August. We started in late September and we finished in December. It was freezing. Oh wow! 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so Laura, have you had any uh, things on on set of movie or TV that were like like a little more challenging or maybe a little dangerous? Um. <clears throat> well, certainly, Australia in the outback. I mean, that was pretty intense. Yeah, Quigley down under. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah that was an intense shoot. Um. Let me think. Dangerous. Um, uh, Oh, that wasn't really dangerous, though. I was a little freaked out when I when I shot Animal Kingdom. I had to be um, sort of uh, tied up in this boat and because I was about to be killed. And so they had taped my wrists and they were it was breakaway tape, but not but not um, super sensitive breakaway tape because they want to give you a little bit of, you know, movement so you don't break it apart so that you can look like you're really, you know, struggling Mm la-di-da. And that I just was so nervous after swimming in the ocean and, um, and being out on the water all day, which I'd never done any water work before where you're going from like, the shore onto a boat, which takes you to a boat, which is like the place <laughs> where you're in holding, waiting to get on a boat. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure Matt could have helped you with some of this stuff. Yeah. Oh, he did. Oh, he did. Yeah. To then to a safety boat where you go out into the ocean where you're swimming. So then you're swimming, and then there's another safety boat that takes you back to a boat. <laughs> so I, kind of my nerves were shot, and I was really nervous the night before. I didn't sleep the night before at all wow and um so we were in this boat and um oh gosh i forgot the actor's name (coughs) cole finn 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 (coughs) and finn is driving this boat which he was either going to be like a boatsman or an actor and that's how good of a boatsman he is and so i actually trusted him but because my nerves were shot, he was going at a reasonable speed to make it look like we were going fast. And I just I said and I had to do this whole like not monologue, but I had to keep talking and talking. And I was like, you guys, when we stopped the boat, I was like, you guys, my nerves are shot. And can you really please go slower? Because I can't take it. I just can't take it. Oh, wow. And it wasn't really dangerous. Yeah. But there comes a point where. I mean, just that day for me, it's kind of a boring story because it's not actually dangerous. But there are times when your nervous system gets shot from everything that you're doing. And oh, yeah. I'm doing a scene where I'm 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 drowning and I'm swimming in the ocean and I'm getting kidnapped. And and I was just a mess. Oh, I mean, I completely understand that you say it's a boring story, but I, I you know, as you're acting, you know, you do have to go through the gamut of emotions and things like that. And, uh, and you know, when you got a physical, physical scenes that are more demanding, maybe it, it could take a toll. So I totally understand that. Yep. Yep. Um, and then uh, let's see. Oh, I did want to mention you, you, you touched on it briefly, Quigley Down Under. Uh, that was a movie you did, a great Western film. I think that's underrated. I, I liked it a lot. And, um, and it was also the movie that I, I saw recently that Roger Ebert, he said that uh, that was the movie that really showed that you had staying power, I guess, after Sex, Lies, oh, and Videotape. Sweet. I don't, re- I don't read reviews either. That is really sweet. Yep. Uh, I think that's an underrated movie, too. And I, I just absolutely love that movie. Yeah. I mean, I think more people should, should check it out. Definitely. It's called Quigley Down Under. And uh, and you, you play Crazy Core in the film. And. Uh, I mean, just a very, very uh, special character, I think, uh, in your in your filmography. Thank you. Thank you so much. I agree. Yeah. I felt like I connected with that 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 character as well. Yeah, definitely. And um, and then I wanted to ask you guys kind of a question for both of you guys. What, what do you since you started acting uh, and to where we are now in 2022? What do you think some of the biggest changes in show business uh, from then to now? Hmm. Wow. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I'll answer for me. I think, you know, at the risk of sounding like, a, oh, something was the good old days. Um, but, I, you know, it's probably more a measure that, that I've just gotten older and I don't have the same, you know, energy for the the life and the struggle of being an actor and, and, and making your, a, a life and 
in this business. But I, I feel like there there really was a line of corporate interest in the movie business where the creative teams that made the motion pictures and made the TV shows, there was more, I think, of a, well, what do you call it when there's a, uh, you know, like a divider between them, like a... a, a, a Delineation. Yeah, yes, there's, there's a word and I'm, I'm, I'm missing it. But anyway, where there's like a, an, under, an understanding that the creative people, the writers, the directors, the actors, the performers who who are making the movie, they, they were, I feel like they were more left alone at a certain point than they are now. And that's sort of the, the, the corporate interests in the success of a movie or a TV show um, are so influential that it doesn't feel the same. Mm-hmm. I feel like it's as much fun, but that's from a person who's been in it for as long as I have. Maybe you ask a 25 year old me, at this time. And maybe I think it's great. I I don't know. Yeah. But certainly the whole social media thing where, you know, if you don't have, you know, they're looking at the amount of followers that you have, the amount of, you know, likes that you get on a, on a, on a video you might make or post on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok, Like, and that, that matters to the people who are casting a movie or TV show. Yeah. That completely like I'm out of that game. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, coming from just a, an outsider's perspective, a, a fan of film myself, uh, I, I see that. I definitely know what you're talking about with the the impact of of those those other elements that is you know goes beyond acting and the purity. I think is uh, is definitely changed in uh, in in some regard. I mean uh, that's uh, so I, I agree with uh, with uh, that assessment. Yeah, and not totally. I mean, I'm looking at television as having an incredible resurgence of like all of these streaming. Like what Amazon does and what Netflix is able to do, like they're they are really making quality stuff. It's really exciting. But what it's like as far as being an actor and getting those jobs and living that actor's life, I don't know. Maybe it's more similar than it is different. I don't know. Interesting. Uh Laura, do you have anything to say on that or just I don't know. I feel like there are way more observant and smarter people about the business of the business than I am. All right. I- yeah, I just kind of want to, you know, show up and do my thing. Gotcha, gotcha. And um, you know, I, I mentioned Roger Ebert a minute ago, um, talking about your performance in Quigley Down Under. He was also him and Siskel and Ebert uh, really liked Stuart Saves His Family. Oh, super! You're bringing up these some of these movies I've forgotten that she's done, and it's really true. She's like did a lot of movies, babe. I did. I did a lot of. Mo- I, I did. did a lot of I movies. did some. I did some movies. I didn't do a ton of movies. All right. Well, we can argue. I, I, yeah, let's definitely let's 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 pencil that in for a nice big argument later. Yeah. <laughs> I I mean I think I think you both have uh, very nice filmographies and um and and just you know another comment on Stuart Saves His Family I, that was a sketch on SNL for those of you who haven't seen the movie with uh, Al Franken playing Stuart Smalley and stuff. Uh, like that was, I think, one of the rare examples of a, a sketch from SNL that was a, put into a expanded into a full length movie that that actually did well. I mean, I, it was pretty funny throughout. I was watching that sketch as we I would watch Saturday Night Live every week, and Al did that sketch, and I said, I the, the second or third time I saw it, I said, "Wow, I just want to see more of this character." Bam. A couple months, months later, I get the call. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I was like, wow, talk about manifesting like if it was always that easy. And that, <laughs> at that moment, it was. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so are you happy with your uh, performance in that movie? I think, you know, I haven't seen it in a long time. But there's some freaking funny stuff in there. And there are some really good uh, funny characters in that movie and it was lovely to work with al and harold ramis i'm so lucky that um i got to work with those guys and it was it was really fun cool and i i really loved that character of um stewart smalley so i was really happy yeah yeah it was a good time i uh, suggest you guys check that one out if uh if you're up for a good comedy um and then matt i wanted to ask you uh, i know you're doing a lot of voice work these days uh, mm-hmm. So, like, 
learning an accent for like a role or a voiceover is that tricky at all? Uh, you know, I feel like in so far in my experience with accents is it either comes naturally to me or I don't get it. Like it's hard for me to learn one that is that doesn't come somewhat naturally and i and i guess I, I i can put it that way there's some some accents come like i can i can get a hook into it um and then some i just can't so i would just say that like so obviously some are easier than others but some i just can't get and uh mm-hmm. i don't do a whole lot of that stuff but you know i do occasionally have to do you know some that aren't easy but for the most part you know it's it's kind of like your big five like you're british you're southern you're east coast new york you're you know occasionally like a you know east indian or but you know the the southern accent the new york accent british australia that all comes pretty naturally it's so fun when you get the hook i mean we talk about that a lot when we're when we're working on different accents and um, <clears throat> it's so fun when you get the hook. It's like, and you just fall into the rhythm and the cadence and the sounds and the vowels and, you, and you're and you cooking and it feels good and it sounds right. It's such a fun thing. Fun it's thing. Like it's a, fun to do. It's like yeah. a dance or it's like when you're singing really great or you get get like a really good, you know, golf shot or Tennessee shot or... <laughs> You know, it's something it's something that it's like a real it's it's a it's a a real little high yeah, to little, get the yeah. accent yeah, for really sure. good. Oh, I, I actually heard a story about um, a Michael Bean who played in uh, The Terminator. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He played uh, Kyle Reese that when he went in for his first audition, I forget. I think it might have been a cat on a hot tin roof or something. He was doing a play where he had to do a southern accent. And uh, and then when he showed up to do the re- reading for Terminator, they're like, oh, he's really good. But, uh, you know, what's with the? <laughs> we don't really want the guy to have a southern accent. So, you know, but but he couldn't he was shaking that right away, you know, because he got it so well, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, it can really sort of work on you for a while, too. You mm-hmm. can, uh, you know, stay in it for mm-hmm. it's easy to fall into it and have to have it sort of creep into your everyday speech. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. So as we kind of wind down here, I just got a few more things uh, I want to talk to you guys about. Have you kept any props from the sets? Like, uh, you know, North Shore, did you keep any surfboards or any of the gear you wore? So I did. I was able to keep a couple of surfboards. They have all since been surfed and broken in various locations around the world. And huh. uh, there, are some re- there are some replica boards around and there are some actual boards from the movie floating around that people have. I wish... I had kept them and not surfed them and broken them, but that's that's just the case. Um, I have some couple of T-shirts, but I have one very special thing. I have a belt buckle from the contest in the wave pool that I win that gives me the check for $500 that I use the money to go to the North Shore. The belt buckle that I win in that surf contest, I still have. Oh, actually, I, actually, I gave it to my wife. Uh, okay. <laughs> Give it to me. I think I stole it and put it on a belt. And yeah, I had it in a box. Wearing. I had it in a box, in the same box like it came in, and then she took it and put it actually on a belt and started wearing it. But <laughs> it is the subject of a really fun Instagram exchange I had with a guy that if you look at my Instagram, there's a video I made about it, and you can it's have a good laugh about it. <laughs> yeah, I'll definitely link your Instagram as well. Um, into that, Laura, did you keep anything from uh, any movies or shows? Um, let me see. I think, um, I think I've called a lot of things that I had. I had some, um, really little things from different plays I had done over the years. And, um, let me think, um, but I think I've I've kind of mm, did a big clean out a couple of years ago, so I don't know that I have. I have a couple of things. I stole something off the set of Just Shoot Me, a um, this really cool kind of goose uh, ladle off the set of Just Shoot Me in the Thanksgiving episode. Um, but I think I asked the prop people if it was okay that I stole it. Um, 
And that's the only thing that comes to mind at the moment. The other things wouldn't really make any sense to anybody because they're just like really little tiny little maybe like something I wore in my hair or a tiny little personal prop. But I know that I have some from some plays, but I don't think I have anything from any movies. I fairly recently just got rid of a a jacket that I wore in Whitewater Summer. Mm. That's almost 30 years old, something like that. So that that piece of uh, memorabilia is, uh, is, is out in the world somewhere. Somewhere. Yes, and I have a beautiful ring that the costume designer of Under Suspicion gave me, a beautiful antique ring that I wore in the movie, and she gave it to me when it was over. I haven't worn it in a long time, but I have it. Oh, that's cool. That's great. Um, so, uh, and, and then I want to ask you, is there, is there such a thing as the role of a lifetime? Are you looking for like, uh, something that you, you haven't done that you really would, would love to have, uh, taken on a, a challenging role or something like that? It's always like the next thing that just intrigues me. Um, that, that's all I'm thinking about is like, what's the next thing I read that I really want to work on? I really want to do. I really want to sit down and work for a couple hours on that scene. What What is that? Like, that to me seems like it's a very immediate sort of thing. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Of course, like a couple of regrets about the 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 kind of some a few biggies that. Got but away. of course, but, you know, n- no sense in um, what do you have regret in one hand and spit in the other? And they're both about as valuable. <laughs> right. Right. I, I hear that. It's uh, no sense really dwelling on that or anything. Uh, well, although I sort of a piggyback off that question would be, um, say you, you were up for a role or you want, really wanted a role. And then, you know, unfortunately, you didn't get it for whatever reason. And then the movie comes out. Do you have any interest in even seeing the movie or do you just stay clear? Um, I think I've done both. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at Matt to see if he knows the answer to this question. Not yours, I don't know. But I know that I I had a couple that were like, uh, you know, that were painful that I didn't get, you know, that, you know, that were sort of colored my wanting to see them or not because it was so, like, so painful. So during the late 80s, like, we're all of us, all of us actors – we're up for all of the same movies. It was all the John Hughes movies. It was, you know, the pretty in pink and some kind of wonderful and Ferris Bueller's day off and all of these movies. Like you knew they were going to be big and you knew they were, and they were great scripts mm-hmm. and so not getting those or getting close on those. Um, and then, you know, you know, the guy who got it, it's like John, John Cryer and Jonathan Silverman killed me in the eighties. Those guys were getting all my jobs. Oh, wow. So yeah. sometimes it was hard to go see those movies. Oh yeah. Um, I, I understand yeah, that. Sometimes they were really painful. The ones that get away are tough. Right. Definitely. I could imagine that. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure what I, I probably won't watch him. I mean, I'm not an actor, but I probably would, I would avoid him myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And um, and then uh, lastly here, I just wanted to ask, um, I wanted to ask you both you guys, uh, what are some of your favorite classic films? Oh, mm. well, my favorite movie, I think one of the best movies made in the last 40 years or so I is Midnight Run. I going to say Midnight it's Run. Midnight Run. <laughs> he loves Midnight Run. Uh-huh. It's a comedy. It's a love story. It's a buddy story. It's the fast paced phenomenal script like it's my favorite movie i love midnight run mm-hmm. i know it wouldn't necessarily be considered a classic but it is to me right that's my movie i'm sticking with it hey that's a good answer yeah it's a great movie i think you've got i mean my movie of my life was deer hunter oh yeah, yeah. i mean that was that was kind of it i also love like all the president's men Bringing up baby, Philadelphia story. Um, Three days of the Condor. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there's so many, but yeah, sort of life movie was um was Deer Hunter. Right. And would you also call those some of your most rewatched movies? Because sometimes you watch a movie, and, and the more you watch it, the more you like it. The more you know, you you notice different things and stuff like that. Mm. Sure. Yeah. 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 Also, the era, the whole like Redford Newman era for me was, you know, big, all those, and McQueen, those, 
Downhill Racer, Butch Cassidy, um, mm-hmm. uh, uh, The Great Escape. You know, like the, those guys, the, the, they were my heroes and my acting heroes, you know? Right, right. Uh, just one right. more thing I just remembered uh, about uh, North Shore. What do you think of the soundtrack of that movie? I, I'm a big fan of the soundtrack. I like uh, Pseudo Echo a lot and uh, yeah. yeah, stuff like that. Would you like the mu- music in the movie as well? You know, it's so funny. It's like it's hard for me to decide, like, to say that I like or dislike it. It's so, when I hear any of those songs, I just, the memory of the movie is so, like, automatic <laughs> i don't know i guess i like it it's so ingrained as a part of my like history when i hear it i immediately think of it but yeah at the time i mean it's so 80s the music <laughs> is so 80s right <laughs> it is but i i, I dig it and uh, it's a whole it's a great production so uh yeah the music the music just added to uh added to the already yeah. epicness of the film Thank you. Man. So, uh, and and we want to let say one more time here, like we said at the top of the show, uh, the charity uh, work you guys are doing for uh, Momentum for Humanity. And uh, again, you want to just say again what it uh, what it's all about? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's an organization that, uh, I, in in the, in the most simplest terms, strives to bring mobility uh, and access uh, to people around the world, people who have disabilities. Um, getting them access to their communities with you know in in various ways yeah uh, and uh and just know uh <clears throat> excuse me anybody who wants to make a donation <clears throat> that your dollar you know really does go to fund the programs that make people's lives better right right it's an absolutely fantastic cause and um and uh, i will definitely leave a link to that so you guys can check it out and I just want to thank you both so much for coming on the show. This has uh, really been a very fun interview for me. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Um, really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for having us on. All right. So take care and uh, be well. All okay, right. you too. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.